Thank you very much, friends, for your kind welcome. I am very grateful to the Resource Center of Medieval Slavic Studies in this university and to the Kilandar Research Library for the invitation to address you this evening. My contact with the Kilandar Research Library goes back, in fact, for 31 years. In 1971, when I was staying on the holy mountain of Athos at the monastery of Kilandar, I had the happiness to meet Father Mateo Mateic and his young son, Fredrag Mateic, who had come to Kilandar to photograph manuscripts. And Father Mateo told me a little about his vision. Now, and he invited me to come here to see what he was doing. And now, 31 years later, here I am, and I see his dream come true. I spent some hours yesterday and today in the research library. And it is marvelous to see what can be done by the vision and the patient persistence of two people. My subject tonight is a monk of the Holy Mountain who at the end of his life became Archbishop of Thessalonica. St. Gregory Palamas, as far as I know, was never actually resident at the Serbian monastery of Kilandar. But for a time he was abbot of the next door monastery, just 40 minutes walk away of Esfigmenu. St. Gregory Palamas has always been honored in the Orthodox Church. He has a special celebration on the second Sunday in the great fast of Lent. But it would be true to say that his theology was largely forgotten and that he, his thought has in fact been rediscovered in the 20th century. The 20th century for the Orthodox Church has been very much the century of Palamas. We have witnessed what can be called a Palamite Renaissance. And when I am asked how I would classify myself as an Orthodox theologian, then I would say I see myself as being in the tradition of St. Gregory of Thessalonica. So, tonight, I want us to ask why he should be important for the world today. First, let us establish the personal connection. Who was he? His life falls into four quite clearly defined periods. First, there are the years of childhood and youth. He was born in 1296, brought up in the city of Constantinople, his father held a high position in the imperial service and was a friend of the emperor Andronicus II. There is a pleasing story told of a meeting of the Senate at which St. Gregory's father was 
present. The emperor turned to him and asked a question. Rather to his surprise, Palamas, the father, did not answer. Usually, when royalty addresses a question, you reply. But in this case, there was silence. The emperor was about to repeat his question in a louder voice. When he looked and he saw that Palamas, the father, was praying, was practicing noera prosevki, mental prayer. In other words, he was praying with the invocation known as the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And when the emperor realized that he was praying, he did not pursue his question, but he went on to discuss other things without interrupting the prayer. To me, that is a striking insight into the atmosphere which prevailed in political circles, in the civil government, in the last centuries of Byzantium. I wonder in the Houses of Parliament in Britain today, or in Congress here, how many people are practicing mental prayer as they sit at the meetings. When Palamas was about 20 years old, Gregory the son, this would have been around the year 1316, his father died, and his mother, with his brothers and sisters, most of the family decided to enter the monastic life. So St. Gregory, with his brothers, took the road to the holy mountain of Athos, the chief monastic center in the Orthodox world since the 10th century, and still today in the 21st century, the chief orthodox monastic center. And this brings us to the second period of St. Gregory's life, the years of seclusion, 20 years from 1316, roughly, until around 1337. Most of this time on the Holy Mountain, Though it was an insecure period, the Byzantine Empire, though very much alive spiritually and artistically, was economically and politically weak. Athos was subject to attacks from pirates and bandits. For a time, Palamas had to go to a place near Veria where he lived in a cave, though he then came back to the Holy Mountain. In these 20 years, on the whole, he was not living in the large Cenobitic monasteries on the mountain, but he spent his time in small hermitages, leading a life of intense silence. Through the use of the Jesus prayer, he learned the meaning of Hezekiah, the Greek term for silence of heart, inner stillness. He became one who practices silence, a hesychast. He would have been taught the use of the constant invocation of the name of Jesus. It was his custom to follow a five-day system. From a Monday to Friday, he lived in total isolation, meeting no one, in entire quietness, practicing inner prayer. And then on Saturday and Sunday, he joined the other members of the hermitage where he was living for the divine office and for common meals. 
We know that this was not always an easy period for him, especially at the beginning. He was subject to severe temptations, to great inner darkness. Indeed, for two years, his constant prayer to God was, Lighten my darkness. Then we come to the third period in the life of St. Gregory, the years of controversy, 1337 to 1347. If St. Gregory Palamas had been left to himself, there is little doubt that he would have preferred simply to follow the life of a hermit the life of inner prayer. But around this time, the way of prayer into which St. Gregory had been initiated, which was practiced on the mountain, came under attack, in particular from a learned Greek from southern Italy, Varlam the Calabrian. And Gregory felt that he must take up the defense of the monks and act as their spokesman. So he had to leave the solitude and silence of the Holy Mountain. He traveled to Constantinople. He was subject to fierce attacks from those who differed from him. It was a period of insecurity, political tension, civil war. For a time, St. Gregory was imprisoned and was indeed even condemned for heresy. But his defense of the monastic way of prayer was vindicated at three councils of Constantinople in 1341, 1347, 1351. And these three councils, though they are only local councils, are second in importance for Orthodox theology only to the seven ecumenical councils. Then we come to the final period of Gregory's life, the years of pastoral responsibility. 1347, he was appointed Archbishop of Thessalonica, the second city in the Byzantine Empire. He was not able to take up office until three years later because the city had been deeply divided. He came as a peacemaker Though his training had been in monastic solitude, he proved a very able administrator, an upholder of social justice, an eloquent defender of the poor and the oppressed. He died 14th of November, 1359, and only nine years later, in 1368, he was glorified as a saint. His feast was fixed on the second Sunday in Lent, it was seen as an extension of the Sunday of Orthodoxy celebrated on the week before. So that is the pattern of St. Gregory's life. He begins in the desert, he ends in the city. There is first a flight from the world a flight into solitude and silence, and then a return to pastoral responsibility. He begins with seclusion, he ends with social service. There is a similar pattern in the lives of many of the saints. St. Anthony of Egypt, though he never returned to the world yet, in the second half of his life, he became, as his biographer St. Athanasius says, a physician to all Egypt, 
constantly visited by those seeking counsel. St. Basil the Great began in solitude, ended as Archbishop of Caesarea. And in the West, St. Benedict began with the hermit life, ended as leader of a whole federation of monasteries. In the theology of St. Gregory, I can discern three master themes. First, he speaks of the two aspects of God. His approach to God could be well summed up in some words of St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 9. There, St. Paul speaks of the Christian as unknown yet well-known. We could say the same of St. Gregory Palamas's view of God. Unknown yet well-known. Mystery revealed. His approach is well summed up in the words of the Anglican author Evelyn Underhill, when she speaks of the nearness yet otherness of the eternal. St. Gregory distinguished between the essence of God, which remains forever unknowable, and the energies of God, which are God revealed. God in action in the world. The second theme I would like to speak about is inner prayer. St. Gregory, as we've already seen, was deeply concerned with the quest for silence, for Hezekiah. And we could sum up his teaching, in the words of a Roman Catholic writer, Georges Bernanos, silence is a presence. At the heart of it is God. The third master theme in St. Gregory's teaching is the vision of light. The heart of his theology, he puts the event of Christ's transfiguration by uncreated glory on Mount Tabor. And so we could sum up this third theme in the words of the prologue of St. John's Gospel. We have seen his glory. Let's look at those three themes. First, the two aspects of God. St. Gregory is keenly conscious of the paradox of God, of the otherness yet nearness of the eternal, of the divine mystery, and at the same time, the divine immediacy. On the one side, God is transcendent, unknowable, beyond all understanding, the holy other. God is what the German theologian Rudolf Otter terms mysterium tremendum et fascinans, the mystery before which we tremble, yet which draws us to itself. So Gregory writes, God is not a nature, for he is above all nature. He is not a being, for he is above all being. God, he is stating here, is not just one among a number of existent objects. 
God exists in a unique and incomparable sense. And to describe this aspect of God, the depth of God, which we never fathom, the unknowability of God, he uses the term essence. But at the same time, Gregory stress is not just the transcendence but the immanence of God. God, he says, is everywhere present and fills all things. God is at the core of every existent object. In the words of a contemporary of Palamas, a friend of the monks, the lay theologian Nicholas Cavasilas, God is more a part of us than our own limbs, more necessary to us than our own heart. So then, Gregory wishes to stress both the unity within God and also the polarity. God is beyond, unknowable, both in this life and the next. He is unknowable to us, not just because we are sinners, but because we are created beings. We shall never know God in the way that God knows himself. There is an aspect of God that remains always beyond all participation. But then at the same time, Gregory speaks of God as within, immanent. The energies of God are not just something abstract. They are God's personal presence. God himself in action. God is the life at the heart of every created thing. Without the presence of the divine energies, Nothing could remain in existence for even a single moment. And these energies are not an intermediary. They are not a thing that God confers on us. They are eternal, divine, uncreated. They are God himself in action. Each Power and energy, says Gregory, is God himself. God is wholly present in each of his divine energies. Here we have an intensely dynamic view of God. We are not to think of God simply as outside the universe the celestial clockmaker who winds up the cosmic clock and then leaves it to keep ticking by itself. We are not to think of God as the grand architect designing the world as an artifact on which he acts from the outside. God is not on the outside he is on the inside of everything. To say that God is creator is to mean that he is within everything that exists as the heart of its heart. So, Gregory's position could be described as panentheism as long as we do not associate that word with process theology. The pantheist says, God is the world and the world is God. And that is not a Christian option. The panentheist says, God is in the world and the world is in God but God is also above and beyond the world. 
That is a Christian option, and that is what St. Gregory is saying. I quoted earlier from the Anglican author Evelyn Underhill. Let me mention a story that she recounts. Once she was going on pilgrimage in Scotland to the holy island of Iona on the far western coast where in the 6th century St. Columba founded a center that led to the reconversion of Britain. And she said to a friend's gardener where she was going, and the gardener replied, Iona is a very thin place. What do you mean, she said? And he answered, there's not much between Iona and the Lord. Now, St. Gregory Palamas believed that this world is a very thin place. God is all around us. The whole world is like one great cosmic burning bush incandescent with the divine energies, burning yet unconsumed. This was what Gregory meant by the energies, that God is closer to us than we ever imagine. St. Paul preaching in Athens to, on the Areopagus, said to the Athenians, who were not yet Christians, Indeed, God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. That is what St. Gregory meant by the divine energies. As St. Paul says also in the first chapter of the letter to the Colossians, in him all things were created, and in him all things hold together. That is what St. Gregory meant by the divine energies. There is a saying that circulated among the early Christians attributed to our Lord, though not to be found in the Gospels, which exactly expresses Gregory's sense of the omnipresence of the living God. Lift the stone and you will find me. Cut the wood in two and there am I. In the words of a great Orthodox priest of the 20th century here in America, Father Alexander Schmemann, the Christian is the one who wherever he or she looks sees everywhere Christ and rejoices in him. That is exactly what St. Gregory intended by his teaching concerning the divine energies. To quote St. Gregory again, and he's thinking of the contrast between the unknowable essence and the ever-present energies. He is both being and non-being. He is everywhere and nowhere. He has many names and he cannot be named. He is ever moving and he is immovable. And in a word, he is everything and nothing. Perhaps the last phrase becomes more intelligible if we say God is no thing with a hyphen. God is not just one thing among many things. God is unique. He remains wholly within himself, says Gregory, yet he dwells wholly within us. He manifests himself in a sense, and yet he does not manifest himself. We grasp him with our mind, and yet we do not grasp him. 
we participate in him, and yet he remains beyond all participation. So Gregory is concerned to affirm, yes, the otherness of God, the beyondness of God. And yet he is also concerned to say, see all things in God and God in all things. Find Christ everywhere. Treat the whole world as a sacrament of the divine presence. That great prophet in 18th century England, William Blake, said, everything that lives is holy. And that is exactly what St. Gregory is telling us through his teaching about the divine energies. He did not invent this distinction between the essence and energies of God. It goes back at least a thousand years to the Cappadocian Fathers, to St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Nevertheless, though he was not an innovator, he was fiercely criticized by others, such as Varlam the Calabrian. Varlam said, this distinction between the essence and energies impairs the divine unity and the divine simplicity. It is ditheism. Gregory answered, God's simplicity is a complex simplicity. We distinguish within the Holy Trinity three persons, yet we still believe God is one. And so the doctrine of the divine energies equally does not impair the unity of God. What Gregory is concerned to say above all else in this teaching on the energies is it is possible even in this present life to have a direct experience of God, to be united with God in mystical encounter. And yet God still preserves his otherness. A true mystical union, yet a union without confusion. Now I come more quickly to my second and third themes. Inner prayer. Listening to St. Gregory, we might well ask, how can I come to experience God in the nearness of his uncreated energies? There is a story told of Thomas Carlyle, great Victorian. One morning he returned from the Sunday service in a bad temper and he said to his mother, I cannot think why they preach such long sermons. If I were a minister, I would go up into the pulpit and say no more than this. Good people, you know what you ought to do. Now go and do it. <laughs> and his mother replied, I, Thomas, and would you tell them how? So, how are we to share in these uncreated energies. Gregory's answer is, be silent. Soren Kierkegaard remarks, if I were a doctor and were asked for my advice, I would say, create silence. And if Kierkegaard in the beginning of the 19th century felt a need for such a doctor. How much more do we need such a doctor today? A great spiritual master of the Roman Catholic Church in the early 20th century, Baron Friedrich von Hugel says, as persons, 
we are what we do with our silence. What do you and I do with our silence? Indeed, how much silence is there actually in our life? And what do we mean by silence? What was Gregory Palamas doing each week in his five days of solitude? Let us recall the words I quoted from Bernanos. Silence is a presence. At the heart of it is God. True silence is not merely negative. Not merely an absence of sound, a pause between words. True silence is surely positive. Not an absence, but a presence. Not a void, an emptiness, but fullness, the awareness of another. In Psalm 46 or 45 in the Orthodox numbering, there is the familiar words, be still and know that I am God. The psalmist does not just say be still, but he continues speaking in God's name, know that I am God. Stillness, silence, in the true sense, means God awareness. So, true silence, understood in this affirmative way, is not isolation, but relationship. Silence, especially in prayer, means receptivity, openness, awareness of the other. Silence means, above all, listening. In the catacombs at Rome, there is often a figure, a female figure, with her hands raised to heaven, gazing upwards. And that exactly expresses the true Christian attitude in prayer. Prayer is to be listening to God, waiting on God. St. Gregory Palamas saw the Holy Mother of God as above all the one who listened, the one who waited on God. He saw her as the model hesychast. So inner prayer means creative listening. And this is always one of the hardest lessons to learn in prayer. How can I stop talking and start listening? When I was a student, one of my favorite radio programs, we would have spoken not of the radio but of the wireless, one of my favorite programs was The Goon Show, a comedy program, probably unknown to most of my audience. And I remember one incident there that's always stuck in my memory. The telephone goes. One of the characters, Harry Seacombe, lifts the receiver. Hello, he says, hello, who's speaking? I can't hear you. Hello, who's speaking? And the voice at the other end says, you are speaking. <laughs> Oh, he says, I thought the voice sounded familiar. <laughs> and he puts the receiver down. That, unfortunately, is a parable of what happens to us all too often when we try to practice inner prayer. We hear the sound of our own voice, but we don't seem able to listen to the voice at the other end of the telephone line. How are we to stop talking and start listening? 
saying Gregory Palamas is on sort of a very traditional answer so far as the Christian East goes is practice the Jesus prayer. Short, repeated invocation. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Actually, there are many variants in the Jesus prayer. It can be shorter or longer. But the essence of the Jesus prayer is that it contains the holy name Jesus, the name given to our Savior at his birth in Bethlehem. That is, of course, a repetition. But St. Gregory, bearing in mind what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, would add, it is not a vain repetition if you say the words with inner attentiveness, with faith, with love. It is a prayer in words. But because the words are few, simple, and constantly repeated, it is a prayer that leads beyond words into silence. A prayer that enables us to find the silence that is interwoven with the words, that is within the words hidden inside them. It's no use saying to ourselves, be silent, stop thinking. You can't turn off the inner television set by a simple effort of will. But what we can do to help reduce distractions, to help center us, is to give to our ever-active mind a very simple unifying task, the invocation of the holy name. We speak, but at the same time we listen. So the Jesus prayer, as understood by Gregory Palamas and the other hesychasts, is a way of listening to God, waiting on him, gazing at him. When I was seven years old, I heard a sermon on prayer in the Anglican church where I was brought up. And children sometimes listen to sermons and sometimes remember what is said in them. So those of you who preach sermons, be very careful. There may be children there listening to you. <laughs> anyway, I was listening and the preacher told a story which I think is connected with the Cure d'Ar in the Catholic Church, but he didn't mention that. Once upon a time, he said, there was an old man who spent hours each day in church. His friends said to him, what are you doing there all that time? And the old man replied, I'm praying. Praying, they said. You must have a very great many things to ask God for. And the old man replied with some indignation, I'm not asking God for anything. Well, said his friends, what are you doing then? And the old man replied, I just sit and look at God, and God sits and looks at me. Now, when I was seven years old, I, was, I thought that was a very good definition of prayer, and I still think so today. So the Jesus prayer is a way of learning to look at God and be conscious of God looking at you. Gregory defended a particular physical technique for use with the Jesus prayer, which had been attacked by Varlam, but which was used by the monks on Mount Athos. This technique involved, among other things, coordinating the breathing with the Jesus prayer. The psychophysical technique of the Byzantine hesychasts has interested people a great deal in the 20th century because of manifest parallels with similar techniques in yoga and in Sufism. But, of course, in the case of the Hesychasts on Mount Athos, they were using these techniques with a specifically Christian prayer. 
the invocation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, incarnate. Gregory defended the physical technique because he believed that the human person is an undivided unity. He didn't consider that these physical exercises were essential to inner prayer. He thought they were merely an accessory, uh, useful to some, but in no ways constituting the essence of inner prayer. But he defended them because he wanted the body to play its part in prayer. As he said, Christ by his incarnation has made the flesh an inexhaustible source of sanctification. The body, he said, quoting St. Maximus the Confessor, is deified along with the soul. So he saw the human person as a single and undivided unity. And that is surely the true Christian view. There used to be a professor of the philosophy of religion in London called H.D. Lewis, not to be confused with C.S. Lewis, who was much inclined in Platonist fashion to emphasize the difference between body and soul. And his students used to say, Professor Highwell Lewis does not go for a walk. He takes his body for a walk. But that is not the true Christian view of the human person. Because my body is me and I am my body. And that is why St. Gregory wanted the body to take part with the soul in prayer. Thirdly, St. Gregory believed that by God's grace, the Jesus prayer brings us to a vision of the divine light. The same light that shone from the face of Christ on Mount Tabor. The transfigured Christ is at the heart of his theology. He is above all a theologian of mystical light. And he believed that the light seen by the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, on the mountain in the Gospels, the light also seen by the monks and others in his own day when they were praying, he believed that this vision of light was not just a created physical light. He believed that it was a vision of the uncreated energies of God. He never says, I myself have seen the light, but he says, the saints see the light, and I have known the saints. Varlam wanted to maintain that the light was merely physical and created. Gregory saw it as an expression of undivided unity with God. But unity with God in his, es in his energies, not in his essence. Here is the way Gregory writes about the divine light. He is mentioning St. Paul's vision recorded in 2 Corinthians 12 when Paul says he was taken up into the third heaven, whether in the body or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Gregory comments, this happy and joyful experience which seized upon Paul and caused him to pass beyond all things in ecstasy was a light of revelation but such as did not reveal to him the objects of sense perception. It was a light without bounds or termination, below or above or to the sides. He saw no limit whatever to the light which appeared to him and shone around him. But it was like a sun, infinitely brighter and larger than the universe. And in the midst of this light, he himself stood, having become 
nothing but I, E-Y-E. Such, more or less, was his vision. So then, why might we consider Gregory a theologian for our own day? Let us think first, then, of his teaching on the divine energies. The universe is permeated by the uncreated power of God. The divine is present everywhere. Nature is sacred. We are to find God in each person, in each thing. Surely, this is highly relevant for us as Christians, living as we do in an age of secularization. Our Western society is suffering from a tragic loss of the sacred. The world has become opaque. It is no longer transparent. It is no longer a sacrament of the divine presence. We feel surrounded by dead matter rather than by divine presence. And the result of all this has been the ecological crisis which grows worse every year. Gregory Palamas can teach us to rediscover the sacredness of the world, to see the world as a sacrament of the living God. He can teach us to love the world in God, for we shall never be able to save the world unless we love it. We cannot save what we do not love. When I was a novice in the monastery of St. John on the island of Patmos in Greece, our spiritual father, Father Amphilochios, used to say, do you know there is an eleventh commandment not recorded in the Bible, and it says, love the trees. And he added, those who do not love trees do not love Christ. When he heard the confession of the farmers as a penance, he used to give them the task of planting a tree. And as a result of that, the whole appearance of the island of Patmos has changed in the last hundred years. Right up the hillside are large, flourishing green penances everywhere. Love the trees, not just in a sentimental way, but for theological reasons, because they and all things living are full of the divine energies. Then there is a second theme in St. Gregory Palamas, silence. He is a saint for our time, living as we do in an age, not only of secularization, but of noise. Noise from aircraft and cars, noise from television, from cell phones, and other such disagreeable things. <laughs> and our age is an age of anxiety, of stress, of tension, because we have lost the dimension of silence. Without silence, we are not really human. Gregory reminds us of the ability, of the value of silence, as one of the deep, primordial elements in our human nature. He can teach us to recover the meaning of silence as creative listening. And then finally, the divine light. Our age is an age of an intense pursuit of pleasure in the West. Pursuit of pleasure, but there is very little joy in our society. We live in an age of depression, despair. Throughout society there's a loss of nerve. I notice that people who are never out of a job are people who give you advice about how to fill up your tax returns and psychoanalysts. Where are we going? Is there any reason for us to exist? Gregory Palamas answers, yes, it is a world of sin and suffering, yet it is still God's world, a world of cross-bearing, but a world in which there continues to shine 
the transfiguring light of Tabor. In the light of Christ's transfiguration, of that face which shone like the sun, of that raiment which was da dazzling light, all human faces can be transformed and granted hope. All familiar things can be filled with beauty and wonder. That is why we need St. Gregory's message about the transfiguration of the Savior. Thank you. one at the back, please. Thank you for that question, Father, and I would like to make it in some ways a little more precise what has an Orthodox theologian such as St. Gregory Palamas to offer. Now, my experience of teaching 35 years in the University of Oxford, I'm now retired, has been this that young people whom I come in contact with in the university are not lacking in a spiritual dimension. They are for the most part not simply materialists, not simply concerned with money and a career. I would say very large numbers of the young people whom I encounter in the university have been deeply interested in spiritual values and in finding a spiritual meaning to their life. But they have felt disappointed in the institutional churches. They have not found that their thirst is satisfied by organized Christianity. And very often when you talk to them, what they have missed has been the element of personal experience. Now, St. Gregory Palamas is precisely a theologian of personal experience. He believes that it is possible for everyone in this life to have a direct experience of God. He does not believe that mystics are a small elite. He believes that the best is for everyone. And therefore, he would say, all humans can come, even in this life, to a vision of the living God in their own experience. They do not just have to learn about God at second hand. Christianity is not just a matter of holding certain doctrines. It's not an ideology, not a philosophical theory, nor yet just a moral code. Christianity, he says, is a matter of the direct, unmediated experience of God. And I feel that if we could put back the element of experience at the heart of our Christian witness, 
people would listen to us gladly. The God who is dead is usually the God of a highly rationalized and intellectual theology. But the God of living experience will still appeal to people today. So there I would see something of the relevance of Gregory Palamas and of the orthodox mystical tradition which he represents. Yes? Double-edged sword, a variety of books that we have on Isikism in the Western world, and especially interest among non-orthodox who without a guidance may indeed end up in spiritual havoc instead of being indeed edified and experience deification. So the question concerns the fact that there are many books, but often they're not going to be very helpful to people if they don't have some kind of guidance. And St. Gregory Palamas would have agreed entirely with you. One of the themes that he emphasizes is the importance of having a spiritual guide if you're going to follow the way of inner prayer. The problem is that in our society all too often people haven't any idea where to go to look for a spiritual guide. If you want to read more about St. Gregory Palamas and the tradition he represents, I would first recommend a book written over 40 years ago by Father John Meyendorf, who was at St. Vladimir's Seminary in um, New York. And this is called St. Gregory Palamas and Orthodox spirituality. It deals not only with Palamas, but with earlier writers in the same tradition. It's a nice book because it's got lots of photographs in it. So as you read it, you think you're getting along at a high speed. Wonderful, you say to yourself, I've read 45 pages this morning. And so it gives you a boost. But it's still... I think well worth reading as an initiation to this whole tradition. There is also a longer book by Father John Meyendorf, um, which appeared in English under the title A Study of Gregory Palamas, but a lot of that is highly technical, though I would recommend the second half of it, the theological part, though after 40 years, there's been a lot more research on Palamas, and certainly Father John's treatment is open to criticism at a number of points and needs supplementing. A friend of mine in England, an Orthodox teaching in the University of Durham, Andrew Louth, is just on the point of beginning to write a book about Palamas. So wait about two or three years and then buy his book and read it. And so I think that is a way of beginning. If you want to know about the Jesus Prayer, there is a short account by myself called The Power of the Name, The Jesus Prayer in Orthodox Spirituality. It's a pamphlet of about uh, 36 pages, but I've tried to give their practical teaching to people who might not have any guidance. And another book I would recommend in the same line is a collection of texts dealing with the spiritual life edited by a certain abbot Caritone, C-H-A-R-I-T-O-N, who was abbot of the um, Russian monastery of Valamo between the two world wars, and the book appears 
under the title The Art of Prayer, an Orthodox Anthology. And that's recently been reprinted, published by Faber and Faber. And that has uh, a number of short texts, um, chiefly from Russian 19th century writers such as Theophan the Recluse and Ignaty Bryanchaninov. Um, it is easier to read than the classic collection on the spiritual life in the Orthodox Church, the Philokalia, on which I've been engaged in translating, but you might like to advance on to that later on. <laughs> yes, please. Yes? Could you stand, please? We'll hear you better. It is a very good thing to have guidance if you can get it. Uh, but I would still say, even if you have not got such guidance, you might wish to read the Philokalia. Um, if you find parts of it puzzling, well, move on, and then you may find other things which speak to your heart. Um, not necessarily everything is written for you personally. Um, most of the texts in the Philokalia were indeed written by monks for a monastic audience, but the editors of the Philokalia in the 18th century, St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, St. Macarius of Corinth, were very clear that this is a book for all Orthodox. And they were very clear that the Jesus prayer can be said not only in uh, caves in the mountains, but also by people living in the middle of the city, married people with families, with um, a secular job. They wanted it to be read by everyone. And it has been my experience that the Philokalia has indeed helped many people but you have to accept that not everything in it is going to be written for you personally. But as you move on, certain things will suddenly come alive and speak to your heart. So concentrate on those things. Yes. Yes. Um, I wish to thank His Grace. I also thank all of you for coming.